Hello, everyone, and thank you for, to Federico for inviting me to this beautifully organized event. So today, I'm going to start a talk on neural world models with a simple question, which is, what is 3D perception? So your eyes receive images on the retina and transmit them to the brain, and the part of the brain that is in the bottom right, uh, bottom right of the image has the task to actually build a representation that allows you to operate within the 3D environment within which you, within you, within which you live. And if you look at typical tasks for 3D perception, you can see them some right here. Right? So you can have, for example, task of predicting uh, the depth map or the distance of objects within an image. You can ask, for example, what part of the image belongs to which semantic category in semantic segmentation. You can have applications for um, AR, like face tracking, to uh, figure out the pose uh, that, uh, the, your, that your face is currently in, or object tracking for like repair applications. And these then have uh, applications that are very real and in terms that have been deployed already in the environment. Like, for example, if you have the, in these Invisalign braces, that's an example that relied on 3D perception, as well as applications in augmented reality with HoloLens. Now, the simplest way of thinking about 3D perception is to think of this image that you're seeing right here and trying to say, how do you build this image? Or what's the model of the reality behind the image you're observing? So in one sense, he's saying you receive this image and you want to figure out what was actually the content that produced the image of the item screen. And these are some very practical applications, right? Because if you look at a popular video game, like the one you see on screen right now, you can actually see roughly the cost that an artist will have to invest to recreate the image that you see in front is roughly, roughly $200,000 to just create one frame of a video game. Of course, this asset will be reused over and over, but it's just to give you an example of how important the problem of reverse engineering the 3D content behind the image is. And of course, this is just a simple application, but one that is perhaps more real is which restaurant do you go and visit when you are in a city? And if you're actually able to reconstruct the 3D scene within, behind an environment, you perhaps can make that choice in a bit more of a natural way. I've run into this problem many times myself. Another one is also which city do you go and visit, right? So pictures are a very incomplete and to me very dissatisfying way of looking at reality. And if you actually take all of the pictures that every human has ever acquired and build a single representation that we all share, I think the content that we can absorb becomes a lot more natural. And an example of this can actually be thought of, of course, uh, for, for ads, right? So if you can actually build a 3D model just from a few pictures of an object, you can have a much better idea of what you're about to buy. And perhaps that will result in less returns to Amazon, which is something that happens more often than I would like to do in my own house. But really, the uh, core of 3D perception, in my opinion, is not really building assets for 3D video games, right? It's uh, really resolving the problem of intelligence for agents that actually operate within our environment. This is the intelligence of my robot uh, in my home, and it actually, its model for 3D perception is bumping into walls until it randomly covered enough of the environment, right? So it, you know, it would be nice if you can figure out a better way of, of building a model that um, allows these kind of agents to be able within the environment. And of course, there is less silly applications than this one, and just cleaning up a corner of my apartment. Autonomous driving is a primary application of it. We are not that far off, it seems. Uh, the deadline changes from year to year, of course. It's always in five years from now, right? Uh, but uh, the detection of 3D objects in the environment is a fairly important problem for autonomous driving. And even more exciting to me is the ability to have fully autonomous agents interact within our daily lives, right? So within our homes. So how do we take now robots that could perhaps could be embodied directly within our environments and operate as naturally as a human being will do? And this, of course, is application perhaps in safety and, uh, and assistance as well. So to, to go forward, I'm going to take a step back now, right? So these are some of the very recent results from the last year. And I want to do a little bit of history, right? So I want to show you how 3D perception changed through the times. So I'm going to start before and then see what happens after deep learning, just to give think, put things into context a little bit. So this is actually a paper, uh, a play on word on Roman was in building a day, right? So that's a famous expression. And of course, uh, the name of the paper is building Rome in a day, right? So this was uh, roughly 2011. You can see the date down there, right? Or perhaps not. And the job was to take pictures from the internet and building these point cloud representations that you have for the environment just by harvesting images in the wild. And the most important uh, outcome of this is actually the calibration of all of the cameras that participated to the construction of these scenes. Right, so the reconstruction of the environment that you had back in 2011 was relatively rough. Right? You have these point cloud representations, and they're relatively sparse. 
If we then move forward in time, you can actually send scene systems that are, allow you to build maps of the environment in real time. So this is called Orbslam, it's a popular open source package for this task. And as you can see, the map that is built at the bottom is still sparse, right? But it's built in real time rather than requiring processing of data over, over days of compute, OK? And this relied on matching of points in the images that you can see up uh, on the top. And if you move forward, something happened actually fairly uh, amazing, I think, in the, in the early 2020s, uh, which was the democratization of 3D sensors. Right? I used to call this the 3D sensing revolution, but where 3D sensing devices move from being something you will find in a typical research lab, you see actually, a, I think this, this device right here is roughly 20,000 francs. Uh, at the time, if I know, 10 or 20,000 francs, and it went down by two order of magnitude to only roughly about $100, right, with the Microsoft Kinect. So yes, the quality was lower, but this allowed for 3D data to be available in everybody's house, despite the fact that perhaps you didn't know. And this allowed for some astounding applications in the reconstruction of environments, right? So this is a Sharam that is picking up one of these uh, devices and is actually building a 3D map of the environment in real time using only these $100 devices, OK? So now, let's take another step back. So this is, I guess, a little bit of early history. But if you now think about roughly being in 2005, and if you look at the areas of computer vision, machine learning, and computer graphics, this is actually a roughly correct mental map, right? Many of you might argue otherwise, but this is roughly OK. So in computer vision, we were really focused on building representations for triangulations, that map, and so on and so forth. In machine learning, everything was about pattern recognition. And in graphics, everything was about modeling 3D shapes and rendering. And these three topics were seemingly disparate. In fact, I took a course in machine learning in roughly 2010. And after about a third of the course, I didn't know why I was there. It's like, I don't do classification, so this seems fairly useless to me. And I left, uh, mistakenly so, I would say. And how did things change in the past? Like, I give you some examples. So this was one of the early examples that I showed you on, uh, on face tracking. And what I'm showing you right here is the intersection of computer vision and computer graphics, right? So much better results in terms of tracking were possible once computer graphics model, that uh, 3D model that you see on the far right, were used to then track these depth images from these sensors to then take these performances and perhaps transfer them to some digital models. Right, so you can start seeing the interaction in between vision and graphics happening, right? Images driven by 3D models, better performance. And then if we take a little bit of a, of a step forward in 2012, we have uh, the big revolution of deep learning, right? So probably the paper that is the reason for which everybody of, of, of you is here right now, right? roughly speaking. And it's at the intersection of computer vision and machine learning, right? That was the key result. The ability of interpreting the content of images with tools coming from machine learning and a bit um, performance of more classical methods. And a side effect of this little revolution was actually the creation of these software packages, which again, most of you are familiar with. But these actually cause ripple effects throughout the rest of computer science. Right? Because suddenly, something that required really expertise from both computer vision and machine learning to happen can now be wi widespread adoption across all disciplines of computer science. The barrier to entrance to differentiable computing was lowered significantly. Right? The example that was in the previous slide, actually, I'm going to go back, this is actually differentiable computing already. So this is already happening at the intersection of vision and graphics, but for you to be able to obtain the result, you needed to know how to code essentially the equivalent of PyTorch of TensorFlow by hand. And once these papers came out and the revolution of machine learning happened, the barrier to entrance to differential computing was lowered significantly, okay? allowing for a lot more work to happen in the area. And an example of this is actually when graphics again approached the former two, and this is an example from uh, from MPI in, in Saarbrücken, where now you don't need any more uh, a depth sensor to drive a 3D performance, but instead you can do it just from raw images. So the machine learning side is for the interpreting the content of the model, the vision side is to project a 3D model to screen, and then the graphic side is to, the, to represent actually the 3D model. Okay? And this interaction for a number of years, uh, roughly in between 2013, 2014, uh, to 2019 was relatively shallow, which I depict by having this small intersection in between these three different areas. Okay? And so why was that the case? What are the challenges that prevented for this intersection of these three areas to not be deeper than what it is right now? And the challenges were representations and supervision. And in more detail is representations for 2D or for video are relatively straightforward, right? 
an image is just a vector of pixels, nothing much more than that, right? And really, there is no really other representation for images that, that you really should care about. It's just a vector of pixels. And there is only a single representation. Everybody uses it and is, is not particularly complicated to use. But for 3D, this is very much not the case. Like on the right, I give you four examples. There is, of course, more than that. Um, I actually never came up with a complete list. You have polygonal meshes, like you see on the, on the top left. You can have point cloud, like in the top right. You have just voxel grids on the bottom left, or perhaps sign distance functions like you see in the bottom right. And all of these have different applications, right? In 3D and in graphics and in gaming, each of these representations is better suited to a different task. And so picking one for you to be able to do 3D perception with is difficult, right? Because each of these representation has its own set of tools that is based on its own architectures for manipulating them, their, their particular pipeline to acquire them, and so on and so forth. So the problem was a problem really of representation. And the second problem is the problem of training data. As you know, deep learning is relatively data hungry. And now the question is like, you know, you train one of these uh, large uh, image and models on GFT 3B, right? So it's 3 billion images. And now you compare it to what roughly a year ago was the largest data set for 3D models. And that's only roughly 50,000 models, right? There is a 50,000 fold difference in between the size of these two data sets. And I'm not a big believer that scaling the size of these three data sets is actually the way forward. So the, the 3D set perhaps can be used for validating your choice, but I'm not sure that going 3D is actually what is going to push us forward. So we have these two problems of representation and data, and then we had a little pivotal moment in research history, which is neural fields. So if you're not familiar with the topic, I'm going to introduce it to be a little bit for you today, uh, but there is actually an excellent survey from CA that was presented at Eurographics last year, and, uh, and the, the pivotal moment was the introduction, introduction of neural fields. Don't get scared by the word. It's actually relatively straightforward. You understand it in a single slide. A neural field, a field is a quantity from physics, right? So if you're familiar with physics, it's, a, it's not a big deal. But a field is nothing else than a mapping in between a position in space and a quantity that you're trying to measure. So for example, it could be uh, x, y position of some function on the plane that you want to model and the height of the function f, x, y. And the way in which they're represented within neural fields is, for example, by using a simple, the simplest form of neural networks, which is just a, a, an MLP, a multi-layer perceptron, right? So nothing else than two layers plus some linearities applied at the colorful dots. And if you look at the way at the internals, which is actually very well depicted by this paper from machine learning theory, the way in which this function is represented is that these representation or this MLP break down the domain non-uniformly, right? So rather than breaking down the domain as a grid, like it happens in images, the weights in the MLP define this decision boundary that then approximate the function with piecewise linear functions therein. So you're basically allowing the network to discover the structure of the of the function you're trying to approximate. And of course, you have the, the universal approximation theory that tells you that if you have enough mappings in between the input and output, you can always recover that, right? So everything seems good. So now, there has been then uh, an adoption of these neural fields to representations of 3D, right? And so what this, is, uh, what this basically resulted in is in trying to represent 3D objects as classification problems, which machine learning is very well versed at. And in particular is the classification of the difference in between or describing the surface of the object as the separation boundary in between the outside of the object and the inside of the object. And this is, of course, a classification problem, right? For any position in space, am I inside or am I outside? That's just classification. And this has then uh, opened the doors to learning of distribution. So the application that you see on the right, people have been chasing it for decades, by the way, being able to smoothly interpolate in between 3D data points, right? So it's a, one of the pivotal tasks uh, that, that enables you to work in, in, in 3D. And if you now look back at this picture, right, so because of the development of these toolboxes right here, then the computer graphics community started overlapping with the machine learning community in developing new representations. And that's what I just showed you, right? The neural fields representation can be thought of being as the machine learning community and the graphics community starting to interact more densely with each other. And finally, the last point, uh, or the last element of the puzzle, now that we have a powerful representation, is how you train this representation. Because the things that you've seen in the right are still supervised by 3D models. And as I showed you, we only have roughly about 50,000 of them, so there's not a lot of data to go by. And the final piece of the puzzle was put by, by Ben Mildenau uh, a couple of years ago at ICCV 2020, and it's NERF, Neural Radiance Fields. Right? And this is nothing else than allowing you to collect 3D representations with images via rendering, actually using classical techniques in rendering. 
All right, so now we, have, we seemingly have passed the two pivotal points or the two challenges of the problem, right? So we were short on data, and we didn't know which representation to use. Now we have both, right? So we can connect 3D models to images. So we have infinite amount of training data. And we have a representation which is flexible enough to be used in machine learning. Good? All right. And this is where neural world models come in, right? So uh, this is not a full, it's a roadmap, much more than, than full results, right? Uh, but the, the, the pitch of neural world models is that if you think about the way in which you think about a scene that you have visited, you can think of it as being a function, right? So every location in space and time, you can think of it as a function in which you're probing information about, right? So you have everything is a spatial feature. So let me be a bit more specific by starting from perhaps the paper that introduced the concept of, of neural world models, which is uh, the generative query networks from DeepMind from a few years ago. Beautiful paper if you have not read it. Right? And the idea of this paper was to build a representation, which is this pixelated set of features that you see in the middle, from natural images in such a way that they can then probe the representation to produce new things. In this case, it was new images of the scene that these two pictures represent. Right? The challenge of this representation is that the representation in the middle is a global representation, right? And this turns out doesn't scale particularly well when you throw a uh, real data. And that's why you see it only here on, on toy problems, okay? And what things, or the way in which things have changed in the last few years, on the other hand, is that you can think of neural world models as being in this format. So you have uh, a function in space and perhaps space plus time, right? And this function stores features that you can query to perform a certain task. And the job of neural world models is to basically take the input from potentially multiple agents, which are the guy down here, and update the internal representation so that the feature content of your world model is more useful for a particular task that you're trying to execute. So it's a very continuous way of looking at the world, right? Because now the world is a function that, needs to, that somebody needs to update and somebody needs to query to perform a task. So in, in this former, I want to show you a little bit the, the characteristics of this. So we have three elements, right? So it's neural, because everything is a feature that will have to be interpreted, and it's trained just by self-supervision. Just reconstruct the data that you've seen at training time, nothing else than that. It's a world model, because, well, it's the world, so the features are defined spatially in space and perhaps time. And it should support multiple agents, right? I don't want to have vision run on the input from a single video camera. I want every single active agent in the universe to contribute information to a shared repository of, of knowledge. And the third one is a model. It's a current understanding of reality. And the features that are stored in the neural model should be used for downstream tasks. So these are the three pivotal elements of, of neural world models. All right? And I'm going to show you a couple of the steps that my research team and my collaborators have been built, particularly in graphics and robotics. And then we're going to move to computer vision. So one first task was the one that you see on screen right now. Right? So for decades, People had built uh, 3D models of humans by asking artists to build them. And these models were actually used for 3D learning applications. So you built a control rig uh, of a human, for example. You asked an artist to build a polygonal mesh representing the 3D shape of a human. And then you asked an artist to define the skinning process that binds these controls to the mesh to then be able to articulate the object in space. And a question that we asked back in 2019, and it was then published in 2020, was can we then replace this entire handmade machinery with neural networks and train it in a fully self-supervised way? And the answer is yes, of course, otherwise I will not be speaking. And you can see an example right here. So the thing is that this is actually the universal approximation theorem. This is a lie, right? Like, you know, there is a theory. Yeah, theory doesn't work in practice sometimes, right? And this is what you're seeing right here. It didn't matter how much we train the model. When you condition the model with respect to pose, like those frames that you saw a couple of seconds ago playing right there, that's the parameter T that I'm passing. And you teach an MLP to store that function that you see in the middle, that's the best that you can get. Maybe in the limit, uh, you know, uh, when the heat of the universe will terminate, the function that you will approximate will be good. But this is actually the function that you get. And what we did in, uh, in this paper a couple of years ago is figuring out that uh, canonicalizing information by bringing it into a common frame of reference and using part-based representation allowed you for having a giant gap in performance for roughly 52% in terms of IOU to almost perfect, 97%. And now if you look at papers that from 2020 to now have been working on, on digital humans, there is a lot of techniques. I haven't kept track anymore because I kind of left this topic. But a lot of the work happening in digital humans are now using variants of what you're seeing on screen right now. Make sense? Another question that we asked is like, well, you know, neural fields are great, but the problem is that we now have people in computer graphics that tend to like meshes a lot, right? 
And so that creates a bit of a problem, because now if you think about having a downstream application, like this little video that I had in the, in the top right, right here, that was a, a, a rigid voice simulation. Those toolboxes needed to actually have polygonal meshes to execute within game engines. And so now how do we connect neural fields to classical polygonal meshes? And this is another uh, collection of works that we did roughly uh, around 2020 again, where we showed that actually for a certain subset of 3D models, in particular convex hulls, you can actually have a dual representation. So these, these quantities can be both seen as discrete sets of, of polygons, essentially, as well as functions in space. And there is a one-to-one -one mapping in between the two that is fully differentiable. And so these allow you to, for example, take an image, pass it through an encoder-decoder architecture that will build a discrete proxy that you could then feed to any downstream application. And this kind of tried to tie together back polygonal meshes together with neural fields again. And these other, um, I'm not going to go in technical details right here, um, is actually the premise of neural fields that the features that you have should be useful for a downstream task. What you're seeing on screen is actually is a, is a colleague of mine that is uh, placing this cup and showing the robot with roughly 10 examples how a particular object should be picked, okay? And that's it. And from that moment on, when the robot is presented with a new object, regardless of the pose that the object is, and as far as the object is within the same distribution, is now able to operate within that representation. And the way in which this is done is exactly via neural world models. Because when these cameras that you see on the corners are observing the scenes, they are creating a function of feature in space, in space, and what the robot is doing is searching through space for the features that match the point at which the gripper had executed. So it becomes a search problem, right? I've seen, what is my cup? Bring me back a cup. So I've seen features existing at this point in space, and now the robot via optimization is searching for a place that has features at test time that look like the one that I've seen during demonstrations. Right, so this gives you an example of, of the downstream aspect of, of these models. Okay? So now the question becomes, all of these applications are powered by 3D data, right? So how do we go from having everything powered from 3D, which I told you is scarce, that's why you have cups, because we have thousands of cups, but we don't have thousands of, of other things um, as 3D models. But how do we mod move beyond 3D supervision? And this is where uh, ben and others had a huge amount of success with NERF. I'm going to represent it here again. And the idea is that if I have a large collection of images, these images are calibrated, thank you, building Roman in a day, then I can actually build a neural representation of the scene that is actually a neural field. Okay? But this process of building these beautiful models, of which I'm going to show you one in the next image. So this is actually a scene that Ben acquired of a restaurant, and it looks stunning with all of the uh, lighting effects also as you're moving around. Okay? This is actually built a neural representation, built roughly from 1,200 calibrated pictures of a completely empty restaurant. Notice the, you know, the characteristics of, uh, of the data that I told you. Right? The restaurant is empty, the image is same taken at the same time of day, and the, uh, there is a lot of them, and they're fully calibrated. So you can tell that these models, where they allow you to connect 3D representation with 2D representation, they have a lot of you know, uh, limitations attached. And today, I'm going to show you a couple of examples of how we are surpassing these limitations. I'm going to focus on the, on the four that I marked in red, uh, and I'm not going to go through the text because it's going to pop up anyway. So the first one is uh, I, can, I can explain this paper to you with a simple question. When you go through a busy uh, plaza in Milan, you can imagine the structure of the plaza as if people were not there. right? And so what happens if I now take a busy, uh, in this case, it's like this balloon being moved as I'm taking pictures, and I now try to build one of these 3D representations from this data. The answer is garbage. You can see it right here. Right? So this scene looks all weird and cloudy, and there is like, stuff floating around, because the model didn't have the chance to understand the data that it was looking at. And what we figured out is that by simply relying on techniques from the 70s, from robust optimization and statistics, we can figure out that we can change the reconstruction loss used to build these models and use robust estimators. I'm not going to go into a lot of details here, to then recover a perfectly crisp scene. And the change from having a least square loss to a robust kernel allow you to discard parts of the data that are not consistent through the acquisition process. Okay, so this is just an example of things that you can do uh, in terms of not, for example, having to kick everybody out of a restaurant if you want to acquire the 3D structure of a restaurant. Another example is uh, semantics. Uh, so we uh, had the first paper on field-to-field on -field translation. Right? So if you imagine that, that these neural world models store information about the environment, this information is built from images, so it's mostly color and perhaps geometry. 
And now the question becomes, how do I start from a function storing colors and geometry and transfer it into a function that, for example, expressed this is a couch so I can sit on it? Right? And in this paper, we actually pioneered that application and took a pre-trained uh, nerve model in input and converted it into the semantics of the scene. Another example of this translation is, on the other hand, uh, serving to users. So the prob one of the big problems of NERF models, uh, especially at the time we were working on this, was that you needed a beefy GPU to be able to use them interactively, right? The, the results look amazing, but the problem is that you needed a $1,000 GPU to be able to see your results. And what we did in this work is actually, again, connect machine learning together with uh, classical computer graphics in figuring out that there is a um, a connection in between volume rendering, which NERF uses, to classical surface rendering. And under certain conditions, I'm being attacked. There's mosquitoes in here. Under certain conditions, the two models are the same. And so what you can do, you can twist the arm of volume rendering in such a way that volume rendering and surface rendering are the same, and this allows you to train a model via volume rendering, but then convert it into a surface representation that you can then serve in real time on a consumer device. So you can actually find some, some live demos of these uh, on the web page if you want. And one final, very important, I particularly like this project. This is not uh, published yet. It's just a preprint at this point. Uh, one question that I ask you is like, OK, fine. Now we have a way of taking collections of images and building a 3D representation, right? And now I come to you, it's like, here is the representation of the scene that your robot should operate in. And my question is, should you trust it? And the answer is no. Because if you're lucky to put your camera or your probing of the function in the areas where you have enough information, then yes, the model will contain the right type of information. But the model has no idea about what it knows or what it doesn't. It does have no idea about in-distribution and out-of-distribution data. Right? And what we did in this paper is actually using, again, techniques from, I guess, classical uh, 3D vision to understand how to quantify the uncertainty in your fields. So if I have cameras observing the data and building a model, and I probe the function in space, can I trust this value or not? And this is safety critical, because if you now think that this is the model that a robot will use to operate within the environment, and you do not know if you can trust it, you can see why this will be, uh, this will be a problem. In this particular demo, I'm showing you how you can take a model, and when you're out of distribution, you can remove the, air, the parts of the data that you don't trust, right? Because um, they've not been observed. And that's actually what is causing all of these uh, floater artifacts within the environment. Yeah. All right? And the final part of the talk is, on your hand, uh, again, about challenges. It's like, all of these problems for reconstructions of scenes that I've shown you until now work in, in this way. So if you know a bit of Bayesian optimization, this is basically maximum likelihood optimization, right? So you're trying to find the model that maximizes the likelihood of uh, your data, right? Conditional likelihood of your data, OK? And on the other hand, these models have no notion about priors, right? The only priors that, that NERF models have is a little bit of smoothness of the functions due to the inductive bias of MLPs. And the question is, like, if I have a, a scene and I'm looking at a scene in an observed, unobserved location, what can you say about that? And the answer is nothing, because you have never seen the data, and so there's nothing that you can say. So using a Bayesian approach, you can say, well, what is the prior, that P of M, that you can put on the model to be able to say something about data you have not observed, on the other hand? and what different uh, ways of doing that exist. This is particularly useful when you take these classical models for reconstructions from collection of images, and you complete, flip, completely flip them on their belly. So if you consider about NERF and these models, this is the setting that you're in, right? You have thousands of images of one scene that doesn't change, right? One scene, many images. And now if you flip these two sentences, you go in many scenes, and of each scene, I give you a single image. And now the question is, can you do something about this? And the answer is, of course, yes, as usual. Uh, what you can do is that you can modify uh, a NERF model to be a conditional NERF model. Uh, this is the first paper, uh, one of our papers that, uh, that did this task. And what this allows you to do is that it allows you to take random pictures from the internet and actually construct the 3D version of that picture, for example, for use in video game applications or authentication and so on and so forth. Right? And this is only possible if you actually have built a model of the data. Right? This is only possible if you figure out that an image is not just a, a picture frame hanging on a wall, but is rather is depictions of, of a 3D representation projected into screen space. Another thing that we, we tried was actually then scale these kind of approaches to planetary scales. So this was a scene representation transformer, which we trained on Street View imagery. 
And the task was, uh, again, similar to the one before. We give a collection of images in input, we pass them through a CNN, and we build these set latent representations. Right? So this set latent is basically a neural representation of the scene that these three images have observed. And then this is a neural world model because now I can have query rays, which are basically coming from the camera that I'm trying to render, and I can render this scene from a different viewpoint. And you can see a couple of examples down here. And the beautiful thing is that this set representation can then be fed to a, diff a slightly different decoder with the last final layers were fine-tuned to understand the semantics, and then you can actually get a semantic understanding of the scene. Right? So these were the early steps in, in bringing neural world models to planetary scale in terms of understanding. And one final example that I want to give you is a, a project that, we, that was presented at, at iClear in, uh, in the spring um, from our group, and is, was the, actually the first manifestation of diffusion models for 3D. Right? So in the previous example, the one that I did in this slide, this process on the right was driven by a regression problem. Right? So regardless, if I gave you the same input, images in input, you always produce the same image in output. It was not generative. And what we figured out, uh, together with the rest of the world, is that if you then use generative modeling, you can actually get much higher quality results in terms of 3D reconstruction. And so this was the first application of diffusion models to 3D. As you can see, we can feed a single image, a single view of an image of a toilet, uh, for example, and then autoregressively build or imagine what the 3D structure of the scene will be from different viewpoints. Okay? And these are actually images uh, scrolled from the internet without background. And this is actually what the network had imagined in terms of what the back of the object would have looked like. And this is only possible if you have built a prior for your model, right? You cannot do it by just, uh, by just regression. All right, so I'm going to conclude with uh, some final remarks and plenty of time uh, for you to go to lunch. All right, so we talked about neural world models, basically building the entirety or storing the entirety of our uh, experience within these models in the world. And now the question becomes, do we have the right representation? Right? So uh, Thomas, this afternoon, is going to talk about his, uh, his beautiful Instant NGP paper, which was uh, one of the key changes in building better representations for this data. Uh, but he's nerfed the representation as perhaps some of these new fashionable Gaussian splatting solutions, the way to go. It's unclear. I'm pretty sure we're not done in terms of building representations, and we're investing fairly heavily in that direction. The other question is, what is the right data to learn from? I'm not a believer that building this like, large data set of 3D objects is the way to go. Uh, perhaps calibrated video, where you have image frames, but also how the camera moves through time, will be sufficient to build uh, data at an uh, extra large scale. And then a question, as I mentioned uh, multiple times in the talk, is what if multiple agents participate in the building of this representation? You have to be able to trust the information that is added to each of these agents to the representation, and then to be able to probe it to perform tasks. And finally, um, you know, earlier on in the talk, I showed you these uh, Kinect Fusion real-time reconstructions of scenes, right? And so while the quality in terms of visual quality has gone up significantly, the speed of the process has gone extremely down, right? We went from a real-time system at 30 to 60 FPS running on a handheld device to something that takes minutes to train. Right, so we got better at something, and we lost something else in the process. And so what needs to be done to bring these systems back to be in real time? And, and somebody earlier mentioned today that perhaps the integration of these algorithms within hardware will be the way to go forward. And with that, I would like to thank my amazing collaborators that are the first authors of all of the papers that I show you today. And I'm free to take questions. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Very good. So we do. We have some time for questions. I see a hand go up over there. Do we have a microphone? It's coming. Here it comes. If you don't mind saying your name, thank you. Hello, I'm Altai. Uh, thank you for your interesting talk. I was just wondering if you could explain the querying of the neural field representation with the ro robotic arm. Right. Like, is it like an exhaustive search? Do we have some s heuristics that guide the robot? So the, 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 you can think of that, but the robot arm as being a coordinate frame in space. Mm -hmm. And we scatter a bunch of points uh, with a Gaussian distribution around that point, and we query the function and the field at those okay. locations. We stack them in a vector and then feed them to. OK, the OK. Yeah. And what about like, if the goal is a bit further away? That's a very good question. I, haven't, I would love to, yeah, you know. I bought some robots to, to exactly start playing with those, uh, with, those, uh, with those aspects. 
I would say probably the question will become you will have to process your fields to then have uh, inf message passing, essentially. Okay. So you could okay. say you could probe information and build secondary fields that have longer term connections in between the data that you have. Okay. Uh, right. So you could either do that or just, you know, build graphs over these and then do it in a different way, but that's completely up to you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, we have a, if you want to pass the mic, that'd be great. Thank you very much for the great talk. So uh, you've mentioned about the, the structure of the input to the neural network. Right. So the input has X, which has three coordinates. And then there is also time, which means the input will variate with respect to time. Right. So what I want to understand, it is this real structure of the input saying that the X, Y, Z, and the time, how the input is structured, including the time coordinate. So it's actually encoded in exactly the same way. So typically, when you work on neural fields, you just add time as the fourth coordinate, and you don't do anything special to it. Uh, most of the, the special part of dealing with time is in the internals of the architecture. So there is different ways of doing it, right? You can modify your architecture to try to separate the part of the scene that is static from the one that is dynamic. So we have some work that in that area. It was d 2 nerf. I haven't described it today, but you can see it there. Uh, dynamic nerf models tend to try to do both simultaneously and not try to do any decoupling. So you can treat literally a uh, space-time scene as just like some function of four coordinates in input and a color in output, roughly speaking, right? Or uh, you could try to then uh, ignore dynamics, right? So we have done work in that topic as well. So you can say, no, my world is static and everything that is not perfectly static is just news and variable. And so you should learn to ignore things that are not consistent in time. So these are the three different ways of doing it. And there is work in all three of them. Oh, so for example, when you have a current image as an input, current image as an input, right. so it has x, y, and z, right. then you want to, that image will variate with respect to time. So right. when, you do, you, when you import the, the, that current image, you can ignore the time or you can ignore some coordinate of the image? It, it depends. What, you can ignore the time if you want and just take that image as you know, time doesn't exist. Everything is perfectly still. And so I should figure out things that are changing time and discard them. That's one way of doing it. Or you can say, no, time is a variable that I care to store because perhaps I'm memorizing a video, and a, a 3D video, right? And so that quantity should be explicitly modeled so I can replay the scene through time. Okay, thank you Those very are the two, much. three, actually, there is. Thank you. Great question. We have time for another one, if anybody would like to go. Thank you. Here we have one in the front here, please. Just raise your hand again. Thank you. Hi, I'm Francisco. So I wanted to ask you, so all these methods for NERF, you are kind of uh, very reliant on having a, a good um, uh, localization of the camera from right. which you took the image. How are they robust to uh, inaccurate uh, localization of the camera? Uh, they are not at all, actually. So if your camera, so there is two ways of dealing with it. Easier you, you you only include images for which you have safe cameras, and there's some ways of measuring it, right? Um, you can provide roughly aligned cameras, and then have optimization processes that can fine tune their location through time. Or you can rely on systems that, given collections of images, guesses the position of the camera that can then be refined by, by the previous model, right? But if you give them, in, in, in this basic form, if you give them not perfectly aligned images, it's just garbage in output. Uh, so that's a, there was a very strict requirement of the model before you start. But people have been working on that to make that more and more robust. So there's actually a couple of papers that came out recently. I haven't even read in that topic, but um, it's okay. very much under. So the basically, all the um, kind of data set of videos that don't have this calibration, you need to That's right. do this um, uh, approximation, the calibration, or to actually use them. That's right. So if, if you cannot get, yeah, exactly. If you don't get a good calibration of the cam, those videos are basically useless, which is what, what the barrier is to be able to use like YouTube videos for this task, right? Because not for all videos you can get camera accurately. But if you add, on the other hand, 360 videos, you could, right? So perhaps mining for 360 videos from the internet will be a much better source for data. And really, the issue is like the, the, the field of view. Uh, there is just not enough information in a narrow field of view to find enough 
static features for you to latch on to then calibrate cameras properly very often. So, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Is there any more questions? Is there a, oh, oh, yep, right here. We have a microphone coming from over here. Thanks. Hello, thanks for the <clears throat> great talk. I wanted to ask about how it is with like precision of the reconstruction. Right. If we take like structure from motion or something, we right. can sometimes get to some like sub centimeter precisions and you right. can use it for measurement measurements and stuff. Yeah. How is it with the models uh, from their fields? Yeah. So there is a there is a project which I didn't show today, which was uh, last year. I'm forgetting time. Um, urban radiance fields, where we actually took the conjunction of the two processes. So you could be as precise as a LiDAR system, but as dense as a NERF model. And so you can have them harmoniously work with each other rather than having to be one or the other. So I can refer you to the paper if you want to know how, how that works. Uh, there's a proof in there that shows you how. Cool. Maybe you guys can talk over lunch. So thank you so much, Andrea. Thank you.